Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this talk on wildlife on uh, Leicestershire waterways. Very pleased that Rosanna Burton from the East Midlands branch of the Canals and Rivers Trust uh, is, is going to talk to us this evening um, about this title. Uh, I think she's going to tell us about some notable finds and uh, talk in particular um, about um, the, the Leicestershire or the Leicester Corridor. Uh, I believe. So, um, Rosanna, if I can hand over to you, uh, we're looking forward to your talk. No, thank you very much. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, nice to virtually meet you all. Um, yeah, so the presentation today, um, I am going to talk about a couple of notable finds, but I'm also going to do a bit more of a broad overview about some of our sort of biodiversity plans, um, generally in the East Midlands and share those with you. Um, as well as any sort of notable habitats and species that our ecological team have picked up recently. Um, but a lot of it will be quite general just for anyone that's potentially um, more new, if you like, to this sort of field. Um, so yes, I am the Community Roots Coordinator, um, but my background is actually in biodiversity. Um, I studied that for about 15 years. I'm actually a county recorder myself, um, but I work very closely with somebody called Derek Whiteley. I don't know if you've ever come across him from Solby Natural History Society, um, but obviously I live in Nottinghamshire, so that's probably why. Um, but yes, I cover Leicester and my role, I'm not going to go into too much detail because my role is very much about the sort of outreach and engagement, trying to inspire people to record, to take care of the environment and to basically look after the waterways for the future. So moving on, I'm just trying to get my slides to share. Just a little bit of background um, for anyone that isn't familiar with the Trust. We did used to be at British Waterways um, until not too long ago, actually, when we changed to the Canal and River Trust. Um, so we're actually the guardian, if you like, for over 2000 miles of historic waterways um, all across England and Wales. So quite an extensive area, um, to say the least. My sort of range, if you like, is very much sort of Leicester city centre. So there's a big urban focus on sort of recording and community projects for me. It's very much sort of following the Grand Union Canal and aspects of the River Saw, um, which I'll, I'll touch on shortly. Um, again, just a little bit of context. A lot of people don't actually know that we have about 63 triple SIs, so sites of special scientific interest within our care. We also have about 50 scheduled ancient monuments. We have the whole infrastructure of Grass Verge um, that runs alongside the towpaths and all the buildings somewhere in the reign of just under 3000 listed buildings. Now, I'm not here to talk about buildings, but the buildings in themselves form some of the most incredible habitats that we actually have in sort of urban Leicester and across our waterways. I'm gonna talk about a couple of the species that we're likely to encounter. Um, our ecologist actually did a walk recently from Abbey Park in the city centre, walked into town um, and we had a few observations of things that we noticed on foot. So I'll share some of these with you. Again, just a little bit of a, an infographic there, that actually we estimate that about 4.4 million people use our waterways. That's a huge, huge opportunity, in my opinion, to inspire, educate and enthuse people with natural history. We need to work together with younger generations to inspire them to be the custodians of our, our natural and built environment in the future. And that is something we pride ourselves on quite a lot in the Trust. Um, as you can see, this was from a, an event not too long ago with them, um, sort of a family going out doing some nature spotting. So it's always lovely to see. Um, a little bit of context, more just for anyone with a navigation interest. Um, the River Saw and Leicester Line is, is the area in my catchment. Um, this is just a little bit of historical background for anyone interested, purely about when the navigations became open to boaters um, and when the Grand Union Canal was actually connected to the wider saw. So as I'm sure you're aware, I don't know how many of you live in Leicester, but it's quite a diverse landscape that today still has a wealth of a lot of traditional features from um, you know, the, the earlier times of sort of freight and things like that for taking cargo between cities. And um, this is quite an iconic spot in Leicester. Uh, the reason I've, I've put a picture is 
just to give a little bit of context of how we've got a lot of development coming together with some of the more traditional canal side buildings. And with that comes a lot of challenges from an ecological perspective because of the amount of pressure to develop the city centre, but also for us and our wider teams to ensure that we can protect, mitigate and enhance and restore what we actually have for the benefit of, of wildlife, not just people. I'm going to talk a little bit more generally um, about key habitats, but I'm going to make reference to ones around the city centre um, and I will touch upon a couple of species, a couple of notable habitats and any sort of observations as, as we go uh, through the presentation. I mean, a lot of this is generally common knowledge, but I think a lot of people don't always make the, the sort of association between some of the navigation and, and the benefits for biodiversity. So naturally canals and river channels provide an extensive network of blue and green corridor, um, as I'm sure we're all familiar as, you know, interests in recording and natural history. Um, they were built, you know, some 200 years ago and actually the original purpose, as a lot of you are probably familiar with, was because of freight and for sort of industry, but over 200 years later, plants, animals, some quite unique ecosystems have started to kind of inhabit um, some of these traditional features. So it's really nice to see how history has moved along and wildlife has moved in. And I think Leicester is quite a good example of that because it is so urban, but you can just walk, you know, a little bit, 10 minutes out of the city centre and you're into sort of a more rural landscape. So it's sort of where the two meet, which I think is quite a, an iconic thing to see. A lot of the bridges and tunnels, locks, weirs, cottages. A lot of people don't know we actually own the, the large majority of these and we do um, sort of lease them out but we also do a lot of sort of protection works as well as being sort of scheduled ancient monuments or listed buildings. We do have, as you'd expect with a lot of the bridges and tunnels, it's fantastic habitat for a number of species. The most obvious one that springs to mind is my sort of species group, which is bats. Um, you know, we do a lot of sort of bat recording and as you'd expect, there is a lot of high binocular and roosting potential in a lot of these old structures. But from a botanical perspective, the actual plant communities, the ferns, the bryophytes, the lichens, um, the whole wealth of those that we find when we're actually doing inspections or doing sort of work is incredible. Um, and I think it's a really, really amazing thing to record and share with others. The, the towpaths are probably the most obvious. Um, we actually manage a lot of our towpaths for the purpose of vegetation um, in terms of pollinators, so sort of pollinator highways, um, but also at the same time, we do have to maintain them for the navigation. So we have certain legislation and things we have to follow to ensure that boaters and the public can safely use these and that sight lines are visible. But with that, comes a wealth of looking at flower sowing, looking at the establishment of wildflowers and actually suspending some of the cutting regimes to allow a lot of pollinators to sort of thrive, particularly orchids, particularly a lot of specialist invertebrate groups, um, which I'm sure a lot of you probably go out and record anyway and, and know how good a verge is. Unfortunately, a lot of local authorities um, in the past have been very guilty of completely cutting them within an inch of their life, um, which unfortunately doesn't allow a lot of the species to thrive and do so well. So now um, our environmental teams are very much sort of up to date with all this, working with our sort of operations teams to see how we can maintain these. And a lot of the work I want to do as well is citizenship science projects in Leicester, trying to get more people involved in sort of recording along the towpath and, and the associated habitats and structures. I think it's a really, really nice thing to try and like a hook to get people involved. And um, so be happy to discuss some of those opportunities in due course. Um, hedgerows is probably one of the best features we have in Leicester. Um, surprisingly, actually in the city center, we've got some fantastic miles of hedgerows that probably have been there for a good few hundred years now. A lot of them traditionally were planted sort of by the canal companies in the 18th century. And as a result, a lot of them today remain untouched. Despite development, we all know hedgerows are massively in decline um, due to sort of land use changes. 
and it is a very important, ha uh, important habitat for invertebrates, for farmland birds, for a whole wealth of species. We actually have somewhere, I think, in the reign of about 600 miles of hedgerow that we manage. Um, but Leicester historically still has some of the best, um, particularly Hawthorne, um, which is very good sort of habitat um, for a lot of birds and sort of pollinators. So actually next time when you're in Leicester, um, obviously when the time of the year is a little bit better, it, it's always a good place to do a bit of a sweep or to have a look. Um, and, and we're doing a lot of work to try and maintain and restore these hedgerows, something I'm particularly very passionate about. Um, sort of traditional hedgerow management. Um, the marginal vegetation, um, as you'd expect with any urban landscape, Leicester's very urban, um, it's a city. There was a lot of development, so a lot of concrete embankments and steel that was put into a lot of the channels um, to actually help with a lot of the freight and cargo many years ago. As we know today, um, there's a number of sort of organisations and partners that are doing a lot of work to try and re-naturalise a lot of the water course. Um, the more natural, the better, as I'm sure you're aware, in terms of the habitat and the vegetation that it, it supplies for a lot of species. Um, in Leicester, in the city centre, particularly um, as you go out towards sort of Walsey Island, if anyone knows that sort of area, at the moment it is very concrete and very post-industrial in its appearance. So what I'm trying to do working with volunteers and our environmental teams is we're looking to put some sort of um, flotation um, sort of reed beds um, like the coir rolls that you put in we're looking to start adding a bit of marginal vegetation where currently we have nothing um, which will really really help provide habitat and continuity along a lot of these these networks so that's going to be nice to see over the next few years as they start to establish um, our team have already been doing a lot of that in Nottingham, and so I'm excited to get it started in Leicester. Um, moving on very quickly, um, reservoirs. Um, obviously, any kind of form of open water in terms of habitat is an exceptional place to record. Depends what your species group is, what your interest is, but I can guarantee there's something there for everyone, be grass snakes on the reservoir, be invertebrates, be wildflowers. Um, or aquatic vegetation, you know, a lot of our reservoirs are over 200 years old. Um, a lot of people don't realise the actual age of a lot of our built structures, and particularly in Leicester, actually, where we're, we're very fortunate to keep a lot of our original structures. So a lot of our teams work very, very hard and close to ensure that we can maintain these for flooding and for water quality, but also to ensure that they remain, you know, a lot of them are local wildlife sites, some of them are local nature reserves, other places have got triple SI status. Um, I've only been in this post actually, coming up a year, but we've lost six months, unfortunately, due to COVID. So unfortunately I haven't been as active in terms of getting out and exploring the landscape as much as I would like to. In terms of why our waterways, what makes a particularly good waterway from a ecological perspective? Um, you know, very much in, in our kind of realm of things, it's determined by three things, water quality, boat traffic, and the structure of the, ch the kind of channel and bank. Again, Leicester, we have twofold. We've got some areas that are very, very good, but other areas that potentially need a lot of work. So we do have areas where pollution is quite rife, um, particularly affluent from a lot of businesses, from farming. Um, which can cause failing water condition in some areas. But then in other areas, we've got bathing water quality standards that are very high. And the biodiversity there is, is exceptional really. So it really, really is a bit of a, an ongoing battle that we face. And um, we tend to find from a recording perspective, the, the greater biodiversity generally tends to be where water quality is high as you'd expect. Boat traffic is low um, because of the amount of disturbance of all the sediment that a lot of boating traffic can actually cause. Um, and it can actually, you know, if it gets quite silted up, it can cause problems for a lot of invertebrates and some of the potential plants and habitats in the water. And I think the most important thing we've touched upon is, is the sort of bank and channel structure. 
we know things like water voles have massively declined for a number of reasons, but particularly a lot of development has been a huge issue for their demise. And unfortunately for them, you know, things do continue to deteriorate in some areas, but in Leicester, we've actually had some positive news that they're starting to return. I know they've taken quite a big hit over the last 10 years. Um, I used to do a lot of recording uh, in the Nottinghamshire area and over a 10 year period, we'd lost 90% of our populations, um, which was quite, quite eye opening to say the least. Um, I've put this very brief map in. I appreciate the detail isn't great. The reason I've done this is I've referred a few times to a walk that was done recently with someone in our ecology team. So we have quite a small ecological team in the East Midlands, but nonetheless an exceptional team. Um, I do tend to feed into bits and pieces that they do from a personal interest and I am trying to get more into that. Um, my, my previous post was a, an environmental heritage officer for five years in the Dern Valley and then I joined the team here and it's been great but it's a lot more multifaceted so as much as I'd love to focus solely on biodiversity I have to do a bit of everything um, so the ecologists uh, are, are very much people I like to work with. Um, so Penny who is one of our ecologists she's a recorder as well Penny Foster she did a walk um, a couple of months ago actually she did a guided walk prior to a lot of um, the sort of COVID restrictions and she walked from Abbey Park, which you'll see on the map. Um, she walked from Abbey Park and she walked straight into sort of the city centre and made um, target notes or a couple of observations. Some are generic and some are a bit more prescriptive. Um, so I'm going to share some of those findings with you. Um, so next time when you're out walking um, in Leicester, there might be some interesting things that you can potentially pick up on. All these orange bits on the map are actually bridges um, in terms of the waterway. So these are usually bridges or lock gates. I think the purple ones, um, they've, they've got a, we've got a key basically on our GIS. So I'm not going into too much detail, but I think that's just a nice cross section to show you actually how many bridges and structures there are on that particular section of the waterway um, that are either managed by us and our engineering teams or by partners such as the local authority. Um, so we spoke a little bit about some of the built structures um, I'm going to kind of make reference to a couple of kind of structures if you like I can't give too much detail in some aspects because of the nature and sensitivity of species even though I'm fully aware that we're all after the same um, the same impact it's just more because it's going into a public domain so I'll be careful in terms of sharing you know grid references and things like that um, from this perspective um, but some more general observations so recently um, a lot of the the wall crevices particularly at North Lock um, I don't know if anyone knows North Lock it is as if you're heading towards Frog Island and um, it's not far from the Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust offices actually it's that section there where there's a lot of development and new high-rise buildings going up um, we've got quite a few lock gates there and quite a few nice bridges. Some are listed bridges, um, naturally, that have got a higher biodiversity value and others are potentially more newer age highway bridges. But nonetheless, they still provide some type of habitat. So recently, um, Penny noted that grey wagtails um, had actually been nesting in one of the wall crevices on North Lock, actually, which was quite nice to see. Um, I appreciate they're not the rarest, but they're a lovely, beautiful bird. And it was really great to see them using the waterway um, in the summer. You could just sort of see them. You can see on that photo there that they were nesting in a lot of the wall crevices there. And I think they managed to successfully rear um, a good brood, actually, by the looks of things, which is always nice to see. Um, anyone that's into sort of lichens, um, I don't tend to do as much with it now, but I know there's some people that do lichen recording. As I'm sure you're aware, with some of these walls that are over 200 plus years old, we've attracted quite an interesting and diverse range of lichens, bryophytes. Um, a lot of these are starting to come back in abundance, um, as a lot of lichens are very susceptible to air pollution and air quality. And as things have started to improve, the city centre has noticed um, quite an increase, if you like, in a, a number of the lichen communities that are starting to appear, potentially because of the amount of work and with 
with the cease of a lot of the industry that Leicester used to be very famous for, a lot of things are starting to return. Um, one of my favourite things that we, we tend to come across is the amount of bridges in Leicester. And um, this one's just on the outskirts of Leicester actually, and is more of your traditional canal bridge, as, as many people, that quaint, nice stone bridge. Um, the wharf building in Leicester, um, again, apologies if no one is particularly local, but things to, to be notable when you're out on foot on the towpath. The wharf building and some of the associated bridges along that particular section have got some fantastic bat um, sort of roosting opportunities. Um, a lot of the bridges, um, excuse me, a lot of the bridges provide great winter hibernacular for a number of species, things like your debentins, which are very much associated with watercourses and gleaning anyway. Um, we've had a lot of the common and soprano pipistrels recorded a few noctuals where it's a bit more dense woodland along the sort of fringes. But the wharf building, actually, we just noticed this year, um, it's, I wouldn't say it's in decline. There's areas that are starting to crumble, roof tiles that have come away. Um, but actually with that, it's opened up a whole wealth of new opportunities for bats to um, capitalise on, on, on this really, to feed, to roost, to hibernate. Um, so next time you're walking along there, um, do have a look out when the, the season's a little bit better. I know we have the swarm season coming up, um, so I'm, I'm quite looking forward to getting out and seeing what I can, can find along the route. Um, going back to sort of invertebrates from sort of a city centre perspective, um, we do have good records of the cave spider. Um, I'll not go into all the Latin details, but obviously we do tend to have the two species. There's the European cave spider and there's the other one. Um, I did a lot of work years ago at Creswell Crags actually um, with the cave spider. They're very much associated with a lot of disused um, kind of old heritage buildings, usually wine cellars or bunkers or viaducts, anything that's damp. Um, dark, they, they don't particularly like light, um, but we've actually had quite a few good numbers of the cave spider um, in and around the East Midlands in the last few years, which is definitely a sight to see. The abdomen is absolutely beautiful. It's it's very much like the size of a small cherry tomato and it's very sort of amber and iridescent. Um, you can see a lot of the egg sacs um, from the ceiling, which is, if you're not scared, I'm not by any means. I think they're a very beautiful sight. Um, another popular one in Leicester is the zebra spider. Um, so the zebra spider, as you can see, looks very, um, very picturesque. It's quite a, a friendly spider, I'd say. I've had no problems with them. Um, unlike a lot of your traditional spiders, they don't use a web to catch their prey. They actually use a jumping tactic to actually, um, you know, attack and take the prey in. So their favourite habitats tend to be the open sunny walls. Again, we have loads of those along the sort of park areas and some of the bridge areas. So where it's a nice sunny south spot potentially, or where there's quite a few nooks and crannies, really, really nice place to keep a lookout for the zebra spider. Reed beds, um, far and few between in Leicester in the city centre. Um, the most characteristic birds that we get in Leicester and associated with reed beds anyway, you, the common reed, um, Phragmites australis, um, is very much your warblers, particularly sedge warblers. Um, we get some reed buntings in other areas and herons, which are usually a very characteristic waterway bird. We have quite a few heronries along um, the canal and the river environment, so they're always quite nice to see. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, reed beds are a, a national UK biodiversity action plan species and from a local bat perspective. We're doing a lot of work in Leicester to try and restore um, a lot of the reed beds, but also extend their range. We do have problems when we have drought and things like that with reeds drying out. So we do have to um, kind of control water levels for other reasons, but for the benefit of the reed beds too. And reeds, uh, common reed is very, very good at filtering water anyway. So actually, in twofold, it's a very, very good way of trying to clean up the water quality as well as providing fantastic nesting opportunity. I know just on the outskirts, we, we there's a lot of nature reserves that potentially have things like bitterns and, and, you know, egrets and things like that that visit. But from a local perspective in Leicester, I 
wouldn't say you'd be disappointed in some of the sections where you've got a good dense cover of reed bed to, to have a look at with your binoculars um, if you're interested. Just conscious of time. Um, moving on very quickly, lock gates. Um, so I mentioned North Lock at Frog Island. Um, we actually do a thing every winter called open lock days, um, which is actually a time when our engineering teams will do essential winter maintenance works. So what happens is the lock is completely flushed. Um, it's all done with ecologists, with engineers. We have a fish rescue program um, to ensure that the fish are safely moved and translocated during the works. And we have an ecologist on site throughout to advise. The reason we have to em empty them is they're quite deep. And as you can see on that photo, one of those lock gates alone weighs somewhere around three to four tons. So it's quite a massive um, project, but we have to do them to maintain the waterway for the navigation really, um, which is a large audience of, of what we do. But actually the exciting thing about lock gates is I managed to get into one. I think it would be, I think it might have been January last year at North Lock, one of the gates was being replaced. And actually I was astounded by the amount of mollusks, particularly freshwater mollusks, which is an interest of mine. Um, there was a lot of freshwater sponges as well, um, which were exploiting, you know, the walls that were very wet and all the vegetation in there. Um, the amount of liverworts as well. I mean, as the water levels vary, you'd get different sort of niches, but the further you went down and with all the silt and sediment, I collected so many amazing mollusk shells um, that I sent to my local recorder. And we were just astounded really to see. So I, I mentioned that it might be nice to work with a local group maybe when the next ones are due, if we have anyone that's particularly interested in mollusks or freshwater sponges to go down with us and do a bit of a recording. Um, exercise um, I thought it'd be nice but also you get to see the lock from a complete different perspective um, and the amount of muscles is is <laughs> incredible um, minus we do have a bit of a problem with the zebra mussel um, but I will come on to that in a minute but yeah definitely if anyone's interested in our lock days we probably will have quite a few plans for the winter works um, so again if anyone's interested in going down and having a tour um, please let me know I mentioned hedgerow, so I won't go into too much detail. This is in Leicester, actually. Um, and as I mentioned, we have 600 miles. I don't know how many miles in Leicester alone, um, but it's it's quite a good number. Um, hedgerows, particularly, we get about 30 types of birds that inhabit hedgerows. Um, as we get just outside the city centre, we tend to get more of your farmland birds where we've got sort of the edges and the offside vegetation with farms and other kind of open landscape, particularly yellow hammers, um, you know, are a frequent visitor that we get. But actually you, you could just have a walk on a spring or a summer day and the amount of bird song, um, there's a wealth of kind of fruit as well for them. There's a wealth of sort of habitat. It's just a beautiful site. And I'm really, really striving in our teams to protect and enhance as much of our, our natural hedgerows as much as we can, um, particularly in Leicester with all the development pressures as well. A couple of um, more detailed observations, if you like. And um, this is a personal favorite. Um, so I mentioned the walk that took place a few months ago. Um, so when Penny was out, um, she actually told us she came across some otter sprain. Um, the otter sprain was actually found pretty much slap bang in the city centre of Leicester, not far from Westbridge, which is a very well used area in terms of people and, and footfall. Um, obviously otters, like a lot of our sort of mammals, have taken quite a hit over the last few years. And with a lot of the work with partners and through the trust, there's been a massive cleanup operation and a lot of habitat works taking place. So it was absolutely amazing. I was so thrilled to hear that um, we had them back. Um, she found some sprint um, and in this sprint there was American signal crayfish remains. Um, so in another respect, fantastic. Um, the American signal crayfish is an invasive non-native crayfish, um, which obviously predates a lot of our native and protected white claw crayfish. Um, it's quite problematic in Leicester and along a lot of the East Midlands. We do tend to work with sort of inns and other organisations to try and combat them. 
but this is great to see that the otters are a natural um, predator, if you like, of them and are helping control the problem. They do tend to have a territory, uh, the males, particularly of about 40 kilometres, so it's quite an extensive range, but fantastic to see that they're looking to inhabit the, the city centre again, which is wonderful news. Um, I mentioned about the water vole, I'm just checking for time. Um, very, very briefly, a lot of people love water voles. Um, and it was great that recently chatting to the Environment Agency, a partner of a lot of the work we do, um, that the water voles are actually starting to make a comeback also. So I mentioned they'd had quite a decline in the last decade, largely because of the American mink. Um, again, there's a whole wealth of work that's been doing with invasive and non-native plants and animals. Um, but actually with a lot of the cleanup works and habitat restoration that's taken place, particularly around Glen Parva and sort of the south of the River Saw section, um, we've had some fantastic records coming in again of new territories, their numbers are starting to steadily build back up um, and less mink, which is fantastic news. And as I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of the coir roll planting with reed beds. Um, so again, where we don't have natural sort of habitat, we're having to, you know, give them a bit of a supplement and a bit of an additional place to feed. They do tend to eat around 227 different species of plant. So I'm sure along Leicester, there's plenty for them to eat. Um, but also they have to eat 80% of their body weight a day to survive. So, you know, and a plentiful food, um, food resource, plenty of habitat to hide from predation is really important. But yeah, there, there's a lot of work in Glen Parva taking place at the minute. Um, it was actually towpath uh, restoration scheme. And as part of that, they've done a lot of complementary reed planting. So really, really nice. I'm really keen to monitor their numbers and see how things go over the next few years and do a bit more in the city centre. More generic ones, just to sort of summarise. Great numbers of dragonflies and damselflies, as you'd expect along any um, sort of riparian corridor. We've had a lot of broad body chases this year. We've had a lot of your common blue damselfly, your emperors. Um, really, really beautiful. Again, just the, the wealth of colour on a sunny day, um, particularly near the near side, smack bang in the city centre. I don't think people realise just how much nature is literally on their doorstep. I mean, 70%, I think, of Leicester's population live within like a two kilometre radius of, of the River Saw, Grand Union Canal. So that's an amazing opportunity to get out there and really, really experience the beauty of it. Lots of wildfowl, um, you know, loads of coots, more hen swans shouldn't be underestimated because they all play their role in um, a nice, healthy river ecosystem. We've had quite a few good numbers in a lot of our areas and moorings um, because of the wealth of habitat opportunity there. So it's always nice to see. Um, also, interestingly this year, um, due to COVID, we've had less navigation on, on our rivers, canals in terms of boats. So actually we've noticed an increase in fish numbers, but also more people reporting fish sightings or particularly identifying certain species. Um, it's, there is work that's done. They do things with the Environment Agency in terms of um, sort of electrofishing to check numbers or translocations and things like that. Um, but actually, because of the amount of the reduction of traffic, the amount of people that are actually really starting to see them and engage with them has been fantastic. So we've had quite big schools of fish in the city centre this year. Um, I'm not particularly good with my fish, but we work very closely with a lot of local fishermen and groups and we do a lot of our let's fish to take people out just to have a go at learning we put them back but it's just for them to learn about what's in the waterway just to sort of finish off um about our more generic bits this document if anyone is interested i'm happy to share this is the trust's commitment to biodiversity it's a very, very great visual document. It tells you about all the biodiversity work that's taking place in the East Midlands and wider in the Trust. And it goes into all the details of some of the species group and some of the specific habitats, which sadly I don't have as much time to cover today. Um, in terms of what we've been doing in sort of Leicester, um, I've touched upon a few of those. The most obvious thing at the minute is the land use pressures. So our ecologist team works very hard to comment on planning applications to try and ensure that we can retain features like hedgerows, um, like woodland coppice, to make sure that 
there's continuity. Um, obviously, a lot of species struggle if there's gaps in that linear connectivity. Bats, for one, really struggle if there isn't a linear route and there's breaks in it because they become susceptible to predation. So a lot of what we do is sort of looking at how best we can look after biodiversity with a huge, huge um, focus on invasive non-native species, water quality, pollution, litter picks, microplastics is a massive thing we've been doing a lot of campaigning about um, because Leicester has got quite a huge issue with, with plastic waste, unfortunately, that we're actually working very closely with groups and organisations to get on top of. Um, Leicester again, um, I mentioned about the zebra mussel and um, for anyone that's interested, invasive non-native species, again we need to record them um, because that tells us the extents, the, you know, the expanse if you like of a lot of these species. The most common problems in Leicester are Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed, floating pennywort and azola, the water fern, which I will come on to in a minute, but the zebra mussel is quite problematic. Um, it's very small, but actually it outcompetes a lot of the native ones and we do have a problem with it. So our ecological teams are very much on the ball with that. Um, and on a lock day, you're more than likely to come across a few in there as well. Um, we're doing a lot of improvement work. So we've put fish passes, eel passes in place. This is where the connectivity um, is potentially become fragmented or there's an issue um, from an industrial perspective. Um, where fish are struggling, particularly things like salmon, they just can't move up the course. Um, so working with the Environment Agency and catchment partnerships, we've been doing a lot of work to enhance the passage where practical and possible. And water quality is always in the back of our minds. We have an environmental science team um, that work tirelessly to look at pollution, to work with local landowners such as farmers to try and get on top of the waste. Dredging, I've mentioned, like any watercourse, Leicester's no different. We have huge problems in areas with sediment and silt buildup, which can actually cause problems from a biodiversity perspective, um, but also from a boating perspective, it's very hard for boats to pass. So we do a lot of work with that. We do a lot of litter picking, and we have a very active volunteer team. And we're doing a lot to work to reduce blue and green algae blooms. So this year we've had a lot of reports like we tend to in the summer where the blooms are quite um, prolific. Generally, this is through excess nutrient loading, um, eutrophication of watercourses, depleting a lot of the oxygen. So again, it comes back to water quality and environmental science, but we're working very, very hard to try and get on top of that. Um, just before I sort of wrap up, um, there's so much I could talk to you all about. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of a general overview rather than a very prescriptive one, just in case anyone's not that familiar with Leicester or quite new to recording. Um, this is an interesting one. So the water firm, um, known as Azola, um, the full Latin name is in the title. It's a very, very problematic um, invasive and non-native species. It covers extensive thick mats of vegetation all along the local waterway. This is actually, the photo is in Nottingham, um, but again, Leicester is, is in a similar situation, not as bad as Nottingham has been. And as I've mentioned before, it stops oxygen and light getting in. It depletes the oxygen, the fish suffer, the freshwater invertebrates do, the plants, it just becomes a suffocation, if you like. Um, so there's been a lot of sort of research from um, sort of DEFRA and similar organisations over the last few years um, where they've actually looked to introduce the North American weevil. Um, it's very, very small. Um, I've got the Latin name if anyone wants to, to look in full detail, but sometimes I struggle to get <laughs> them out. But this North American weevil, um, they introduced 3000 into the air wash and actually you can see you know the results are in the photo it's been an amazing success there was a lot of work done working with scientists ecologists um you name it to make sure because obviously it's non-native and we're talking about a problem of managing invasive and non-natives and then we're introducing one but actually it doesn't cause any problems to any native um species it, what it tends to do is azola is its main food plant and they tend to reproduce quite rapidly 
So actually, as they're reproducing, there's a lot more weevils in the water that are obviously eating away at the azolo, which then frees up the natural flow and current of the river again. Um, so I know they're looking to trial some similar um, situations in Leicester where it's quite rife there. So there's a whole article and there's a separate presentation for anyone who wants to find out about that volunteer project and how successful it's been. Um, but from a biodiversity perspective, um, I used to <laughs> I used to record um, a number of weevils um, with Alan Lazenby. He I don't know if he's well known in your area. He was our beetle kind of go to guy. And it'd be interesting for anyone that records beetles to find out a little bit more about this project and how we're using weevils because they're so small and so many species. So many people don't know just the, the full breadth and actually you know the amazing science each day that's been proven to help restore things and I think <laughs> in a nutshell um that is my very very quick um overview of Leicester and what we do from an environmental perspective um I want to leave a little bit of time for questions um how am I doing for time Alan <laughs> yeah no that's good we've got time thank you uh very much yeah um We've had one question already. Uh, whenever we do one of these things and anyone mentions mowing in any context, it always becomes the uh, the center of the discussion. So maybe we'll get this question out of the way first. I don't know if you can see the uh, the chat window, uh, Rosanna. Um, Jeffrey asked about uh, mowing regimes. Um, uh, uh, what, what, what does the trust use? Does the trust use its own staff for maintenance or do you use contractors? So we have contractors actually called fountains, um, which our operations team um, tend to manage, if you like. So we, we have a contract agreement, as you'd expect, and they come in at certain times of the year and do a frequency of cuts. Now, that is something that I tend to not fully immerse myself in because of my role. But it is something that working from a, a biodiversity perspective and working with our environmental teams, we're trying to look at actually reducing the frequency of cutting at certain times of the year in areas where we've got good records of um, particular wildflowers or good invertebrate records. But at the same time, I'm very much of, of the thinking that we need the baseline data in the first place so we can actually establish if there's been a decline or a, an increase. We do have records um, and I'm sure in areas there are, you know, orchids and all sorts of amazing wildflowers that would probably benefit from not being caught maybe three, four times a year. I don't know the frequency. I can certainly find out. Um, the reason I mentioned it in this talk was in my previous job, I worked with the three local authorities to, so it was Rotherham, Doncaster and Barnsley, to look at the reduction. It was more from a cost saving perspective from, from their end, but my interest was biodiversity. And they actually noticed a few years ago, they had, um, I can't remember which orchid it was, was it a bee orchid or pyramid orchid? I don't know, there was, a, there was quite a nice orchid there. So they suspended the cutting as a pilot and then literally within a year, they had over 500 orchids recorded on this roundabout and this verge. So I've tried to take the learning from that and take it back to our team in Leicester to, to say the same really, how we can... But the only problem I will say with that is because we are a charity that's not just committed to biodiversity, but we're very much about the navigation and, and keeping that functioning for you know boaters for people there is certain legislation and guidance that we have to uh, in terms of sight lines in terms of getting boats to be able to moor up so if the vegetation becomes you know too rife that can cause problems and we can be up to penalization for that but the other side of that what i will say is we don't own um, as much verge as people potentially think we do. It gets very complex with near side and off side vegetation along the watercourse. A lot of it's local authority, some of it's environment agency and some of it's ours, but it becomes a mass exercise um, establishing the full blown ownership along the East Midlands. Sure, um, I, I can imagine that's complicated. But whenever this comes up, and as I say, it comes up a lot, um, it, it always comes back to the same thing. 
um, that, that whatever organization is responsible for the management spends an awful lot of time thinking about biodiversity and drawing up the plans uh, and, and obviously discusses that and agrees it with the contractors and then the contractors come in and they do they do whatever they want to do anyway and someone said uh, I think last week someone said oh well the contractors think if they you know if they mow it more uh, they'll, they'll, they'll be they'll think that that you know they'll be regarded as having done a good job and they'll get more work in the future and I've, I've certainly had this in the past in the local churchyard. We, there, were, there was an awful lot of work drawing up a very detailed plan about which areas were to be mowed and which areas were to be left. When the contractors come in, they just cut everything because they certainly weren't looked, they, they didn't spend the time to look at any plans. They just mowed everything. And it, it's, it, it, is, it is a problem. I think the only solution is, is really having in-house staff that you have control over because I've yet to talk to an organization that has control over contractors. Nobody seems to be able to do it. So it's a It's interesting it's a you should problem. mention that um, because in my, my, my predecessor role, if you like, or actually, I don't know, I, I'm just a wealth of talking today. So apologies, I don't get out much at the minute. Um, but no, in the previous job, this was very much uh, became an issue. As you just mentioned, they were saying, right, you get in highways, for example, or certain staff that are basically just told to go and cut this verge on this day at this, you know, when actually a lot of them aren't actually trained to understand, not, not any disrespect to them, but they're trained to go and do the mowing, but potentially their understanding and their knowledge of why they're doing things isn't there. So what we looked at doing was an in-house training program where actually we were working with in-house staff and contractors and our ecological teams to actually go out and make them aware of why we were doing it and to actually try and really, you know, have some sort of dominance over why we're doing it not just to go out and say right you're cutting this area it was very well mitigated and there were people shadowing it at the time to make sure that this didn't happen now i appreciate the operations from the trust perspective fountains is just a contractor that we've used for quite some time now um but i know that we have probably a similar problem as you've mentioned they'll just go out and, and they go and cut it and what we've actually noticed is with COVID, whilst a lot of staff have still been maintaining the towpath from an operational perspective, a lot of the verges have naturally grown anyway with all the weather we've had and people, because Leicester went into lockdown, people weren't going out as much. And I think what they've actually noticed is that actually it's not that bad. Um, they could go a little bit longer. They could save quite a bit of money. And you know, the biodiversity and the aesthetic interest. So I think, I know that doesn't answer the question, but my point being, because it's been left for a few months with nobody actively being able to do anything other than essential maintenance, they're starting to see that actually they can withdraw slightly from it. They can do a reduction. And I imagine with the current financial climate as a charity, we depend very much on a whole wealth of different income streams that anything that we can do to try and save money so we can better other projects. And I think grass cutting, in my opinion, is, is one thing that we could save quite a bit of money on from a contractor perspective, but it needs to be mitigated, it needs to be controlled, and it needs somebody to oversee it. Um, the, the, there are certainly people here this evening who would be very happy to advise about particularly sensitive areas and sensitive sites, because we have very, very good botanical records for Leicester, uh, Leicestershire, and and you know uh, I, I'm sure we could we could draw up help you draw up a list of sites that that need special management uh, maybe, um may, maybe we should we should park mowing there briefly maybe people will get in touch with you and talk about mowing more I'm sure they will, um are, are there any other questions is there anything else that anyone wants to ask. I would say that um, David Nichols, who's part of the Nature Spot team, is the county recorder for mollusks. And oh, I'm sure you. he would be uh, interested uh, in seeing some of your mollusks and also helping you if there's, if there's any help needed with, with identifications. And he, he's, you know, I mean, it not, it's not just the big stuff, it's the, it's the teeny tiny, it's the, it's the one millimeter long ones that we're interested in as well, everything. So, no 100 percent, and this is what i've said a lot of you more obvious groups get get recorded 
but a lot of your more specialist groups. Um, I mean, I used to do a Sky and Mizids workshop, you know, snail killing flies and the most prescriptive things you can think of that people are like, what are they? And I'm like, but these are things that people don't really think about. And mollusks, again, you know, we were quite fortunate. We had a terrestrial mollusk recorder, but he doesn't, he doesn't specialize in freshwater. Um, so then when I came into this post, I was like, oh, Robert, like, um, you know, it's a different county, which I'm still trying to, to get to grips with in terms of geographics of oh, sending yeah. records. Um, but we, we can certainly help you locally as well. So, um, yeah, we, we've got Thank you. And, and yeah. Um, any, any more questions from anyone? Nicola? It's on mute. You have to put your mic on, Nicola. Um, I wondered if you'd like to comment on larger mammals, native mammals along the waterways. In what context? Uh, what records are there from a canal and river trust point of view in terms of habitats for, for deer and things? I think a lot of the records, I did ask this question because when I started, I asked about what we do with biological records. And as I'm sure you're very much familiar, it, it's a very difficult one in terms of locally is meant to go nationally and nationally fees back down to local, but there's always a delay in that, um, that I've noticed certainly anyway. Um, in terms of more terrestrial mammals, we do have records for things like red deer, muntjac in terms of particularly a lot of the gardens that if you like, go along the canal in the river. I would say there's always room for potentially more records that I think the trust could do a lot more from my personal perspective in terms of biological recording and actually, you know, making people aware that you could just take a walk along there. And if you see anything, why not use something like the Nature Spot app? Or if you're not familiar, take a photo. And I think the problem is a lot of people don't know particularly where to send records unless you're from a group such as this. I know certainly from an ecological perspective, the teams that I sort of liaise with, most of the records tend to be things like, as you'd expect, you sort of mink, water vole, um, otter. We've had things like stoats and weasels um, in some other areas, badgers again. Badges comes up quite frequently, as do foxes, um, because of it being such an urban area. But again, I certainly think a challenge I have come across in Leicester is in the city centre, it is very diverse. Um, the amount of cultural restraints I've come across since being in this post in terms of there's a whole wealth of black and ethnic minority groups, which are a fantastic group that we need to engage with and build rapport with but it's just something that's not on their radar. Um, not all of them, but a lot of the groups I've come across, I mean, there's 80 different languages spoken in Leicester and particularly around the two kilometer radius, a lot of them are Indian communities or um, Caribbean or Somali. And locally from my community work, a lot of them don't feel the confidence to actually go and explore the local waterway. I mean, a common one, which you wouldn't believe, was that a Somali lady said in Somali culture, they don't learn to swim. So naturally, none of their families would want to go and visit the canal or the river because they're scared. They also believe there's crocodiles in there and it's a very, very dangerous place. Um, I wouldn't say, I, I guess my point to your question is, I think there's definitely more we could do. But I think that is something to be aware of, that culturally I am very much of the mindset that I'm trying to engage with these people, but that is something that potentially isn't on their radar just yet. We're just mm. trying to get them to look after like plastic waste or litter or mm. illegal drinking. And I would love, when I first started, I said I'd love to do a citizenship science project. I'd love to do a recording project. I would love to do something like that. And the Wildlife Trust were really keen. And um, I've, I've done a lot of stuff in the past with um, National Biological Records Forum. Um, loads of stuff there. So, so much wealth. But again, the flavour of people that were signing up for it were very white British, middle class, which is fantastic. Yes. But we're trying to diversify our offer if we want these to be custodians. Mm -hmm. So I think my point to that is it's... It's baby steps. Um, I'd love to say, can you record mammals? But a lot of them don't even know what a mammal is. Um, a lot of them are scared of insects. Um, it's an ongoing struggle. Um, but I think there's definitely, from an outreach and engagement perspective, you know, a great opportunity there. So, 
Yeah, we do have records. I think we tend to send them, I could be wrong, um, to the local authority. Do we have a local authority? Um, just less to have a biological record centre. Absolutely. The, the, um, the, the biological record centre is at uh, County Hall. Um, but anything submitted to uh, Nature Spot and, and then verified uh, by the Nature Spot experts goes into the county records as, oh, wow. as well as into the, uh, the, the national records on NBN. So certainly um, do feel free to refer people to the Nature Spot uh, website. They want help identifying uh, anything they may have seen. Um, and also, yes, the, the Nature Spot app people might might want to use as well. So yeah, yeah I think no, hundred percent. I mean, I've always had this. This has always been an issue from a recording perspective. I don't know if it's something that is just in sort of the Dern or the Knotts area, but we've noticed that when you send my port of call from my previous job was send it to your local authority record centre first, because that way it could be used for planning applications as a first point of call. There's a lot of national recording schemes which are fantastic, such as Nature Spot, which I've, I've advocated a lot in the past as well. But we've noticed in other regions that actually the time delay of records going to a national scheme aren't filtering back down locally. I don't know if you've noticed yeah, no, that, I but that seems to be quite an so, issue. So the Nature Spot model is to work bottom up. We we um, uh, we we um, verify anything that's submitted to us that we're able to confirm. And that goes to the county records at County Hall, uh, and it also goes to the national schemes, because I think you're right, it, it, it's much better to go bottom up than, than it is to come top down, because the, the national schemes aren't always that good at distributing data. And if you, again, if you look on the Nature Spot website, you can see all the maps, you can see where plants have been recorded and different things. It's very easy to follow the track of the canal and see where we've got records and see if there, where there are gaps and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, but I think I think we can probably work together on that, certainly. No, I think that'd be a nice thing to look at, to to look at areas where potentially records are low. Um, yeah. Again, I know there's a lot of specialist taxonomic groups. There are so many amazing groups and we have so many amazing recorders. But again, I have to kind of stop myself sometimes because from my personal perspective, I, I want to do that. But in this role, I have to kind of start off on basics, even though previously people I were working with already were a little bit halfway there do you know what I mean they were already sort of well conditioned to recording whereas you know some of these hard to reach communities it's completely a new have thing you, have you run any bio blitzes um so actually well, yeah not I, this I, year obviously but in other years <laughs> um so obviously I started in July last year um and then I was furloughed in February for six months I've just come back a couple of months ago I've had to revise my whole delivery program but yes in my original plan and for next year which I did actually get in touch with somebody um from your sort of organization when I first started but I don't know the name of him but I never I don't know if you had some changes or if somebody changed or uh, not not that I'm aware of but but the next time you're thinking of doing a bioplex yeah please involve us yeah. well now I've got a contact that'd be wonderful because sure. I was speaking to Ben Devine at, um well he was at the Wildlife Trust obviously as you know he, he does a lot with Nature Spot and we were talking about how there'd be such a flavor and a need for doing something around sort of the canals um and in the city center but we also can get like extra um access if you like to some areas so like when I mentioned when the locks are being drained that's a winter activity slightly different but that can be done and um, we have access to boats as well I've done I wanted to do some back tours on boats at night where we're sort of listening with the detectors um, but bio blitzes yes I very much did write and I think four seasonal bio blitzes into my delivery plan and a whole host of nature walk and associated activity yes yeah. some, something for next year yes Definitely. Don't do it all in the first year, Nicola. No, I've got two years to do it. I've lost a year, but um, yeah, two years to go. <laughs> Nic Nicola, you want to come back? Just in? one final comment. Um, supporting Nature Spot, um, Rosanna, would be to, if you see opportunities for being able to um, widen the scope of Nature Spot to those other communities that you're in contact with, that we're less in contact with, then again, that's that would be another... Uh, opportunity to take take forward um, and I, I've specifically got um, linked with uh, 
user groups that use the waterways in terms of kayaking and canoeing. So again, if you've got specific interests, if you flag them up through this group, they can no, be it, they can be shared and yeah. vice versa. There may be opportunities for for them to contribute if you need manpower. No, and I think 100%, thank you. That was very much how I tend to work anyway. I mean, you can't work in isolation. You know, there's one of me. Um, Leicester is a very challenging area, but one full of opportunity at the same time. Um, and a lot of the first few months were spent developing relationships, getting to familiarise myself with the area and the problems. Um, you know, it was quite different coming from doing post-industrial mines. Uh, so I used to do loads of brownfield reclamation and restoration. That was a big thing for invertebrates I used to do. And then I came to Leicester and it's great, but obviously I've come from Barnsley, which is 97% white British. So obviously the challenges and the interests and opportunities are very, very different. Um, but I have some fantastic links with Somali groups, Indian groups. We don't try and we don't like segregating them in that respect by any means. Oh, it's no, about no. diversity. Mm. But I think the point of me mentioning that is there are cultural sensitivities. So when I do stuff with the Somali community, the women tend to do things separate to the men. So if I it's things that I have to be mindful of. If I was to do a nature walk, that I would have to probably do something for the women, you know, by themselves and the children and the men elsewhere and um, but again there's some fantastic opportunities and it's great that now I have a contact mm -hmm. with, with you guys and you know I'm really looking forward to it's a good time actually because I'm starting to revise everything for next year we just don't know what situation we're going to be in because outreach is very very difficult at the minute when we can't physically be face to face with people and Leicester suffers quite a lot with digital poverty in the respect with things like the St. Matthews communities and those sort of areas that are quite deprived. A lot of people don't have access to mobile phones and the internet. So again, it's it's offering a whole wealth of other means for people to, to be engaged that we don't cut anyone out, if you know what I mean. Uh, whether that goes back to more traditional paper records, which I know a lot of my naturalist friends carry a notebook and they're very, very um, traditional in that respect and then they'll upload them. Um, but yeah, sorry, I'm rambling on. But yes, th there's some fantastic opportunities there, and it'd be really nice to discuss that with you all at a later date, most certainly. Well, we look forward to that. Uh, probably got time for one more question. If anybody wants one, probably sick of me now. <laughs> I can run the full course of the canal. Well, what I would ask people to do is to go on to the uh, wild places section of the Nature Spot website and have a look along the route of the canals and the waterways throughout all of Leicestershire, not, not just Rosanna's patch, but uh, we've, we've got them from, from north to south. No, um, nothing in Rutland, as far as I'm aware, other than Rutland water. Um, but um, uh, um, have a good look, see what's there, see where the gaps are, and certainly, certainly do some recording. So um, thank you, uh, Rosanna. Uh, that was uh, that was great. We very, very much appreciate it. And uh, let's hope we can we can work closely together in the future.